Tomorrow's December 1st. We're leaving Black Friday behind, and this is the last episode of 30 videos in 30 days, and yes, I'm pretty freaking tired. Now, it's that wonderful time of the year when we all come together and honor one of the most beloved traditions, consumption. And we all know that that means that it's time to gorge yourself on questionable food and to buy gifts for people that you can barely tolerate. It also means that you should be mindful of your wallet. This is the time of year when people tend to spend more money than they normally would. And while let's face facts here, musicians and recording engineers aren't exactly swimming in cash like Scrooge McDuck. And I thought maybe it's time to do a video on some things you can do to stay afloat with your finances during the spending frenzy that is the holidays. Let this video both serve as a guide and as a warning. Here's 13 ways to avoid putting yourself into crushing debt. Number one, don't take out massive student loans. I've spoken about this a few times now, but since you guys are musicians, you might need a <clears throat> friendly reminder. In short, recording school is fucking expensive. Tens of thousands of dollars a year expensive. And in order to afford it, you're gonna have to probably take out a student loan. And even if you do land a job in the music business, which according to a poll I did a few months ago is pretty fucking unlikely, you're going to be stuck paying off your loans for years to come. And the worst part of all this, interest rates. Now they might seem pretty low at three to 6%, but don't be fooled. With the amount of money we're talking about, the small percentages are gonna add up real fast. Just think, instead of an exciting career recording chart-topping bands and winning major recording awards, you'll spend your life paying people for the privilege of owing people money. All the while working at a shit job for shit wages because the oligarchs at the top of the company that you're gonna wind up working for need to take trips into space and debt is a great motivator. So get ready to give up your dreams and get to work. Now, I am very glad to see some people are finally opening their eyes to this predatory nonsense. The only problem being is that most people only seem to realize this after they graduate. Now, if you're really interested in learning how to record and mix, I'd recommend heading over to Spectre Digital and spend a few hundred dollars instead of tens of thousands. We make no promises of job placement or a career. We only promise great instruction at a very reasonable cost. Number two, easy on the subscriptions. Hey, Pro Tools and Adobe users, this one's for you. In the recent years, we've seen an astronomically dramatic rise in the number of subscription services. Everything from streaming TV shows and music to monthly deliveries of wine and sanitary products. Bass players, do you know what those are? It seems like almost everything has $9.99 monthly fee attached to it. There are so many out there, you might not have realized that you've signed up for more than you've bargained for. Ultimately, the problem with subscriptions is that you're spending money not to own something, but to rent it. And the more of these that you buy, the more your bill is going to hurt at the end of the month. The truth is most people already live with things like rent that they can't afford, or a phone plan, internet, and adding things you don't necessarily need will empty your wallet pretty damn fast. Things like gym memberships, cable, Spotify, Netflix, so on, so forth. They're great to have, but at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, do I actually need all of this? You'd be surprised how often the answer to that is no. And speaking of needing stuff, number three, wants versus needs. We must consume, we have no free will. There's a big fucking difference between wanting something and needing it. For example, you need food, water, and shelter to survive. You don't need the latest iPhone and you most certainly don't need the newest one every single year, no matter how slick the ads look. You know what else you don't need? Another tattoo! You guys might not know this, but edgy paintings on your skin really won't help you when you're living under a bridge and looking for tires to burn to keep warm. Same principle applies to music gear. You might really, really want that new $1,000 guitar you've been looking at for the last two hours, but that's $1,000 you could be doing a thousand other and possibly better things with. See, when it comes to buying new things, humans tend to let the lizard brain take the wheel. And while buying that new toy, opening it up and playing with it can feel rewarding, it's not something you're gonna take long-term pleasure in. I'm not saying to not treat yourself, but please try to be smart about it. And our next point might help you with that. Number four, buy used. The used market is a wonderful resource for everyone looking to save a few bucks when buying gear. And I'm not just talking about eBay. Look locally, visit your local pawn shop, or better yet, find an online secondhand market in your country and start browsing. 
Believe me, you'd be surprised at how many people out there are desperate to get rid of totally usable equipment. This way, you'll also avoid commission fees like Reverb.com's completely reasonable 5%, and you can also avoid the completely overblown moral superiority that Reverb.com throws in for absolutely free as well. Now, do beware, since these markets are mostly unregulated, you can run into some shady son of a bitch who's gonna try and rip you off. I was buying a used base cabinet a while back and the guy I contacted brought me into this barely lit basement to try it out. Sure, at first glance and listen, everything seemed fine, but when I got the cab home and played with it for a while, I noticed one of the speakers had cuts in it and you could almost see right through it. Take the time to test used stuff out extensively before you buy it, and if the seller has a problem with that, tell him to go fuck himself. Oh and bring a flashlight. And to the guy who sold me the defective base cab, may Krom bless you with a bald head and impotence. And I think you're well on the way to that first part, scumbag. Number five, research what you're buying. Whether you're buying new or used, please, please actually do some research. And I don't mean just Google the shiny new toy that you're eyeing, dig deeper. If you're interested in buying a mic, a preamp, a compressor, whatever, don't just stop at the one you've been told to buy. Find out how and why people use it. Look up some alternatives and only then make your purchase. And do be mindful of online articles and reviews because by crumb sweaty balls, people are fucking dishonest. Look, I'm not making this up. You show me a negative article about any piece of audio equipment and I'll show you the progressive human rights policies of North Korea. And this isn't just a modern phenomenon. Over the years, I've collected a fuck ton of magazines about guitars, recording gear, you name it. And guess what? Not one of them had a single negative review in it. They weren't reviews, they were fucking paid advertisements. It's the main reason I stopped reading Recording Magazine and EQ Magazine after subscribing for so many years. You guys might remember that I did a review on the Clark Technic Pultec EQ clone. And let's just say it didn't fare all that well. But if you look at the online reviews of that piece of shit, they might lead you to believe that it's not even that bad. Yeah, keep telling yourselves that, guys. Whatever helps you sleep at night. Now, if you're going to use articles, YouTube, or the internet in general to inform you for your purchases, make sure you get your information from a source that you can trust. Now, I can only speak for myself, but I have never said something good about a piece of gear if I didn't absolutely mean it. And if something is truly awful, well, it winds up on the wall behind me. Yes, the Clark is definitely up there and it truly does suck, no matter how many have raged online at me for daring to suggest so. Look, you wasted your money on a shitty piece of gear. Get over it! Number six, beware the credit card. If there is one point on this list that you should pay extra attention to, it's this one. Credit card companies love to take advantage of people's urge to buy shit that they don't need. And they make an absolute killing off it. How do they do this? Well, a credit card is basically an on-demand loan. When you're buying a home or starting a business, you're more than likely going to need a loan. It's a large sum of money you'll be expected to pay back, and not everyone can get one things like credit score, income to debt ratio, and collateral are all taken into account before you can apply for one. Meanwhile, all you need to apply for a credit card is the monumental achievement of being at least 18 years old. And in some cases, you don't even need a pulse. Now, let's not forget about the rotten cherry on top of this shit Sunday, those crom damned interest rates. You thought the interest rates on your student loan was bad? Well, credit card companies charge an average yearly interest rate of 20 fucking percent! I'll explain this as simply as I can. The average American has around $5,000 in credit card debt, and most people tend to only pay off their minimum rates. So if your credit card company has a yearly interest of 20%, you're only paying your minimum rate of about 1.5%. Guess what? It's gonna take you more than 20 years to pay that off. Drummers, I know your math isn't all that great, but please try to pay attention here. Let's say your minimum is $84. That means your yearly minimum payments are going to add up to $1,008. Sweet! That means I only have to pay off the remaining $39.92, right? Wrong! After the year passes, your credit card vampire overlords are going to add 20% of your remaining fee to its total, meaning you're almost back to where you started at $47.90. This will go on and on and on until you eventually end up paying more in interest fees than what you actually owe. Millions of people are trapped in this predatory system, so do yourself a favor and don't be a sucker. The only way to win this game is to not play. Number seven, diversify your income. 
Over the years, I've had a number of people approach me asking for employment. Hey, Glenn, I want to work for your studio. Are you hiring? As a matter of fact, yes, I am. How well can you edit videos? Edit videos? No, I meant like record and mix and stuff. Well, I've kind of already got that covered. What I'm really looking for are people who can help speed up my workflow in other fields. Things like editing video, recording good guitar DIs, programming plugins, running a website, shit like that. Well, I can't do any of that. All right, well, why don't you call me when you can't? Look, making money running a recording studio is difficult. Most bands tend to record themselves and making money selling music, well, <laughs> good fucking luck there. The modern recording age has brought all that into people's bedrooms, and unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of money to be made in recording bands. The thing you have to realize is that for a few hundred bucks, just about anybody can do what you can do. So if you want to compete, you have to be able to offer people something they really can't do on their own. It's basically supply and demand. And with a little bit of creativity, you just might find a few extra ways to make a few extra bucks. If you have the ability to record live drums or you know how to re-up guitars really well, or you're great at editing videos, you can certainly make a name for yourself, both in the local scene and online. And you can even find business on places like Fiverr. It might take some time before you make any waves in the industry, but if you've got the skills and you've got the drive and are willing to put in the work, believe me, people will seek you out. I've actually hired quite a number of guys off the SMG Discord to help out with a production of this show. Now, if only a few of them could learn to shoot decent guitar videos. Number eight, ditch your car. Okay, let's be clear. There's nothing inherently wrong with owning a car. I own one. But on the other hand, it's also a good idea to weigh your options. Sure, owning your own personal vehicle is great, but it's also stupidly expensive. Not only is gas expensive, but so is maintaining the car. But you want a Tesla? Great, you'll save a fortune on gas. And it's also gonna cost you twice as much to get anything fixed on it. And let's be clear here, Tesla is very anti-right to repair. What am I talking about with extra costs? Well, plenty of countries and provinces have mandatory winter tire legislation, annual checkups. Hell, it can cost money just to register the damn thing you paid for already. And let's not even get into one of humanity's greatest inventions, the fucking toll booth. Look, most places except for Los Angeles have some form of public transportation, which is way cheaper than owning a car. Sure, you're gonna have to deal with minor inconveniences like other passengers, but you'll save yourself a small fortune. Even better, ride a bike to as many places as you can, except in Los Angeles because nobody can drive there and you'll wind up dead. Need something from the store? Ride your bike. Need to get to your obscenely expensive classes at Full Sail that won't get you a job? Ride your bike. Graduated from Full Sail and need to get to your fast food job? <laughs> well, you're on your bike anyway because there's no fucking way you can afford a car now. Number nine, cook your own food. Did you guys know that the average American household spends almost $3,000 a year dining out? Really? I thought it'd be more considering how round almost half of them are. Seriously though, if you wanna save yourself a couple hundred or even a couple of thousand dollars each year, start cooking for yourself and stop going to Starbucks. Brew your own damn coffee, you lazy fucks! And stop feeding the corporate lifestyle machine. Get an AeroPress and grind your own beans. It's way better than that slop they serve up anyway. Now, why do I say this? Two reasons. Number one, the average restaurant and takeout markup is around 300%. So instead of preparing your own meal like the way how you'd like it, you'll pay three times the price for the privilege of waiting 45 minutes to eat a two day old frozen slob of lasagna at TJI Fridays. And number two, rising fast food prices. McDonald's, for example, has gotten more and more expensive over the last two decades, and the supposed value menus aren't exactly filling. Not only is fast food horribly bad for you, but it's also absurdly overpriced for the amount of food that you're actually getting. Not to mention that the people working there are working way too hard and getting paid shit wages by a company that makes billions. So stop being lazy, pick up a pan, and cook something for yourself for a change, you lazy shit. Now go check out my friend over at the Headbangers Kitchen. He's got some amazing videos and can even help the most inept of you finally make something edible. Number 10, give up the party life. You thought the 300% markups at restaurants were bad? <laughs> Bars are worse, with alcohol markups averaging at around 500%. I get it, sometimes having a drink with your friends can be fun, and spending some time off work can certainly help your mental state. But if you're dropping $200 a night on cocktails, you really need to reevaluate your priorities. If you wanna make money in the music business, you're gonna have to give up a whole lot of leisure time, and that includes going out every single weekend and getting shit-faced. Number 11, 
work from home. Considering the current situation with COVID, some of you guys might not even have a choice in the matter, but nonetheless, it's a great way to save some money. Not having to pay for gas or public transportation goes a very long way. Plus, you won't have to shower every morning and you won't have to go to your local Supercuts every two weeks for that $30 haircut that you needed so badly. Oh, who am I kidding? You guys are metalheads. We don't get haircuts. Haircuts are some of the worst decisions I've ever made. Do keep in mind, this can vary greatly depending on where you live and what your job actually is, but a good rule of thumb is to talk to your employer and negotiate some terms. Office space costs a shit ton of money, so if they can cut costs that way, just by having you work from home, you can bet they'll be more than happy to oblige, at least at some companies anyway. Some others are still insisting for a return to the office, even though profit and efficiency skyrocketed during the work at home era. Some people just need to let everyone around them know that they're in charge and you need to be put in your place, you filthy surf. Remember folks, there's a labor shortage on right now. So if your boss is insisting that you return to the office for no other reason other than to stroke his own ego, look for somewhere that will let you work from home because plenty of places are hiring. Yay, capitalism! Number 12, savings. Now, earlier, I mentioned how much people love to spend money. Whenever we have disposable income, we kind of want to spend it. That's okay, it's only natural, but a fool and his money are soon parted. In pro audio, we call them Clark Tech Tech customers. Now, don't be a fool. If you're making a halfway decent living or you just decide to be smart for once, start putting away a chunk of that money into an open savings account. That is, unless you're living in a large North American city, in which case you'll need three roommates just to cover the rent for a studio apartment. Good luck being able to afford groceries. Now, for those of you who don't live in large North American cities, a savings account is a deposit of money you can leave at your bank. They then use your deposit to loan money to other people for various things, such as open businesses or buying endangered species as pets. And the great thing is that by doing so, you'll actually earn some money due to annual percentage yield. For example, if you open a savings account with $10,000 and your bank has a 0.5% APY, that means by the end of the year, you'll have 50 extra dollars in there. Sure, that might not seem like a lot, but it's better than spending it on three days worth of coffee at Starbucks. You don't even have to do this at a bank. You can put a chunk of your monthly paychecks into a jar. By doing so, you'll have your own little insurance fund and you're exercising a virtue that's sorely lacking in the today's world, patience. It can take some serious mental determination to not blow everything you have on the first shiny object that enters your field of view. So having some form of savings can definitely help you out in the long run. Number 13, wait for sales, but be warned. If you're genuinely interested in buying something and you can't find it used, a good rule of thumb is to, well, just wait a while. The very thing you're looking to buy just might go on sale sometime soon. And whether you're getting something with a bigger price tag or buying in bulk, sales can certainly help relieve a bit of those costs. Again, I'm not saying don't buy anything ever. Hell, go ahead and treat yourself from time to time, but try to be smart about it. And I can't stress this enough. Do your research. Find out what the regular price on something is before you part with your money for it. Don't just go to a guitar store, check an online retailer. Or better yet, check them all. There are plenty of sites that will automatically check prices at various retailers. Compare prices and then make your decisions. I'd also suggest that you watch out for fake sales. Big box retailers just fucking love to do this. They'll add an arbitrary crossed out number next to the actual price of a product and pretend like they're offering you a great deal. If you're looking to buy something, keep track of the prices for a bit and see what kind of savings you're actually being offered. Also, don't be a sucker when it comes to those extended warranties. Most big box retailers aren't actually in the business of selling goods. Their real business is selling you insurance because it's almost pure profit for them. Consumer Reports called this shit out as a scam years ago. Don't be a sucker. Don't fall for it and tell the asshole trying to rip you off with an extended warranty, no. Let's be very clear, you don't owe him any explanations. And if he demands one, walk out, cause fuck that guy. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. I'll leave you with some final thoughts. Burying yourself in debt is a lot easier than digging yourself out of it. I urge you all to do your due diligence and be mindful of your finances. Your future is ultimately in your own hands. Don't squander it on some superficial shit. Stay level-headed and on next time, stay metal, my friends. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Fuck! Okay, no burp yet. Probably not. Uh, there we go. Uh, well, fuck. Because plenty of... Pro mm. Look at that one more time. That was good. <laughs> Roger. No, that's not moving. There we go. I think that got it. <sighs> that kind of fucked that up. I call them pro audio. Oh, <laughs> One more time, one more time, one more time. That means you God damn it! <laughs> Fucking hell. Fuck off. Can I, like, I don't need that going off right now. Fuck. Oh shit, did that stop? Motherfucker, it did. Okay, hold on. <laughs>